morning looking at the day of Pentecost and all that happened on that day. I mean, this there are days that turn the tide of history. Days that, that change things. We think about uh, D-Day. That, that day that changed uh, the, the tide of the war. The, uh, we think of the Battle of Gettysburg that they call the high water mark of the Civil War. Days, specific days. There are days in our lives where it's different from the day before. For those of us who are married, the day that you, that you got married or the day that you were proposed to, that day changed things. Da- a day, sometimes we say, what a difference a day makes. Well, that's, that's true. What a difference a day makes. And this day of Pentecost, they celebrated Pentecost every year. But this particular day of Pentecost changed as no other day did. So much happened on this one single day that we'll need at least one more uh, lesson after this one. And I may actually break up Peter's sermon into two separate messages. There's just so much there that we need to know. I'll, I'll see what I'll do with that next week. But as we dig into this one, Uh, Let's begin with a moment of prayer to prepare our hearts. Father, we pray that you will open our hearts and our minds of understanding. May the Holy Spirit that resides in us speak to us your word today. May, May we just learn from this scripture things perhaps that we did not know before or things that help us to understand scripture better. It's such a learning process, Father, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to learn. We thank you for your word that it has been preserved for us. Thank you for the resources that we have to learn from. But above all, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who speaks to us and guides us as we learn on this day as that Holy Spirit was given. So I pray, Father, you will bless this time of study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just want to do a short review because this all has to flow together, particularly when there is a scripture that is uh, uh, covers many things that happens on a single day. We have to keep going back because remember, there were no chapter and verse breaks. And so as this was written, it, it all was written together, but it all happened together. It, it, it all was taking place back to back. And so it was all happening together. So on this day, first of all, three things happened initially. Three signs were manifested on this day. Verse 2, we have the wind. Verse 3, we have the fire. Verse 4, we have the utterance of other languages. So listen to those. Well, let me back up. Let me pick up verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, remember it had fully come is what that word means. They were all together in one place. Now there's differences of opinion again on exactly where that one place is, but that's not the focus here. What's more important is what happened. Verse 2, and suddenly, I mean, it just, it, suddenly, think about this, suddenly there came from heaven a noise, an echo, say, a, a sound that reverberated like a violent rushing wind. But there was no wind stirring, it just was the sound. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them, all those who were there, tongues as of fire. It was as the fire came down in one solid mass and then distributed itself among all of those who were there, actually being visible above their heads, distributing themselves, and they, that is the fire tongues, rested on each one of them. Wasn't a bigger fire on Peter than there was on, the, on one of the women. A bigger one here, a little one there. No, it was the same fire on each of them. And verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So, so we have this, this wind and this fire and this language. Each of these things were very significant in Jewish history. We read this and we read it like an event taking place, which we should, but we have to put ourselves into the Jewish mindset to understand 
the importance of these things on this day, each of these things would have, would have triggered a thought in the Jewish mind. Now for you and me, things will happen and it, it will trigger a thought of another day. Like for instance, when we, when we gather here in a few weeks and we put flags on the cemetery, on the veterans' graves, that will trigger in our minds. That has a significance for us. The fact that we are putting a flag there has a significance. It represents something. We understand that representation. On this day, the Jews there would have understood all, all of these things. They would have understood the wind. Remember, Jesus had told them, the, the Spirit moves like the wind. They would have understood the fire, God's presence in the fire. They would have understood the languages. Each of these things had huge significance. We talked before about how Jesus explained to Nicodemus that the Spirit, the Ruach of God, the wind of God's presence came and went at its own desire. We saw that in the Old Testament. That, that was found throughout the Old Testament. And it was something, as, as in our women's group when we studied chapter 3 of John, we saw that it was something that Nicodemus should have known. I mean, Jesus referred to him as the, definite article, the, the teacher in Israel. Well, he, if he was the teacher... He should have known. He should have recognized how the Spirit would move because it's all throughout the Old Testament how the Spirit moved. And, and as I was thinking about that, I thought all this multitude gathered together, these believers, I bet Nicodemus was there. I bet when this wind, the sound of this wind came, Nicodemus was like, oh yeah, I know what that is. It was something that he would have known. God's presence was often seen in the wind. In fact, he spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. Fire was also a presence, a picture of God's presence, a sign. God spoke to Moses, you remember, in the burning bush. We mentioned last week the fire of God's presence coming down at the dedication of the tabernacle and again at the dedication of the temple. But on that very first Pentecost, remember this day, this Feast of Pentecost was a, a celebration that they kept. It was a feast that they kept every year. Remember, there were seven of them. We talked about this was just one of the ones that they kept. So it was a commemoration of something that had happened in the past. The Jews looked at each one of these feasts, these seven feasts, as commemorating something that happened in the past, or excuse me, in the past, but also a picture of something that was going to happen in the future. So in their minds, they, they were looking for a double fulfillment, celebrating what happened, looking to what would happen. This particular feast, this Pentecost, was, I think I mentioned this last time, this was the birthday known as the birthday of the Jewish nation. It, was, it took place 50 days, remember Pente, meaning 50, Pentecost, 50 days after the Israelites left Egypt. They traveled 50 days. They crossed the Red Sea. They're at, at their celebration of Passover. The, you know, the, the death angel passed over all of the houses that had the blood on the doorpost. They left Egypt, and 50 days later, they arrive at Mount Sinai. God actually spoke to them on that day in Mount Sinai. I want to just share this, this with you briefly, just a couple of verses. You can read all about this in Exodus 19 if you want to go back and read this. But on that day that the Jews understood as the birthday of the nation, that day that God gave his covenant for the Jewish nation. Listen to how God manifested his presence on that day. Exodus 19, just going to read a couple of verses, verses 18 and 19. Well, let, me, let me back up 17. Moses brought all the people of the camp to meet God at the foot of the mountain, at the foot of Mount Sinai. Verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. Verse 19. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him. Some translations say answered him with thunder. But the word there is literally answered him with a voice. So look at the comparisons to that. 
There was the wind. There was the sound of the wind, not the actual wind, the sound, the mighty sound of the wind. And there was the fire and there was the voice on the first day of Pentecost. And now we see that again on the day when it fully came. So like we said last time, the people knew exactly what was happening. The Jews would have recognized those things. You and I have to be told what these things mean. But the Jews being there that day, I mean, think about it. This is a real day. This is really happening. And in their minds, they see that fulfillment. They don't have to tell them what the fire represents. Don't have to tell them what the sound represents. They know what that means. But still, this, the, the, it wasn't like it was some strange thing that was happening to them. They, it, was, it wasn't like they were just overtaken by something they didn't know what it was. They knew what it was. They knew. I can't stress that enough. They knew what was happening. Now, granted, it was happening to them. They weren't making it happen. These things were happening to them. When it says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, that word filled is in a tense that, me- that means they didn't have anything to do with it. It, it. it came upon them just because they were there. Just because God had promised that it would happen. It happened to them. This Holy Spirit was filling them. It wasn't their doing. But still, they recognized it. They recognized it as the fulfilling of the promises that Jesus had made in John 14 through 16. And and I wouldn't have really put that together except that in our women's Bible study we just studied John 14 through 16 and all these promises go back and read that of all the promises that Jesus made I will not leave you as orphans I'll send the the comforter I'll send the advocate I'll send the helper I, I didn't go back and look how many times but all through chapters 14, 15 and 16 Jesus is talking about I promise you I'm going to send him I promise you I promise you and so this day the promise was fulfilled. Jesus promised them that, that after he went away, that this comforter, this advocate, this helper would come. But he told them, if we saw in chapter 1, he said, now wait for it. Wait for it. It's going to come. Be ready. So how did they recognize it? How, how did they know? How did they know that this was the filling of the Holy Spirit? I've really meditated on this, pondered on this. I got tickled in our Sunday school lesson. The guy in the lesson talked about when you marinate on the Word of God. I'm like, marinate? Now that's an interesting word for thinking about Scripture. But it's, it's a good word. I marinated on these words this week. How did they, how did they know that's what it was? They, un, I, they would have recognized the fire and the wind and the, and the voice. But how did, they, how did they recognize that they were being filled with the Holy Spirit? That, that, that had fascinated me this week. I don't know just how they recognized it. But, but I have to come to believe that it's like this. These people had known Jesus in the flesh. They, as the song says, they walked with Him and they talked with Him a long life's way. They had been with Jesus. They knew him personally. And there was something about what they were feeling now that was the same as that. that, that that's, all I can, that's all I can gain from it. They recognized what was happening to them as an extension of having walked with him. Now, you and I have, have never walked with Him in the flesh. We can't compare this to that. But we do know that there's something different. We do know when you feel the Spirit moving within you. And for these people that day, they couldn't have kept quiet if their lives depended on it. Something happened to them that day. Look again at verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that Jesus had promised, an extension of Jesus. They were filled with Jesus that day. 
and they begin to speak with other tongues, other glossolalia, <laughs> other languages. This was not an unintelligible language. This was a recognizable language. Other, heteros, another different kind of language than what they knew as this spirit within them gave them utterance, gave them the ability to do that. But now why would God do that? I mean, why would God choose to manifest his presence to let the world see the evidence of the Holy Spirit by giving them other languages. I mean, why would God choose that thing? We'll see this, this manifestation happen three more times in the book of Acts, actually. And there's a specific reason for it, and we'll cover those as, as we go through. We gave a couple of hints last time of why this would happen. First of all, we want to talk about the pictures. What, is it, what did it represent? Well, a couple of those hints were. One was a picture of the regathering of languages that God had separated at the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 10, we find a, a list of nations. And sometimes we, we read Scripture and it's just this, is the genealogies or these lists are just like, oh, this is really dry and I can't pronounce these names anyway. But there's a reason for them to be there. This list of nations, the 70 nations that came from the three sons of Noah after the flood. We find that in Genesis 10. Well, in Genesis 11, we find the story of the Tower of Babel where one man, actually his name was Nimrod, set out to make a name for himself. That's, that's the key there. False worship. In fact, you can trace every false religion back to the Tower of Babel. But, but at Babel, so what God did is he separated. They all spoke the same language, and it was being used for evil, for, so God separated those languages. And so what's happening here is a picture of God bringing the languages back together for good, for the sharing of the gospel to all the nations. But there's another reason. Think about what is happening on this day. We saw last time that Pentecost, in addition to celebrating the gift or the giving of the law of Mount Sinai, was a celebration of first fruits. It, it, it had a practical celebration to it. It was the, the, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. At Pentecost, um, excuse me, at Passover was the harvest of the barley. At Pentecost was the harvest of the wheat. So they brought two loaves, two different kinds of loaves of bread, and offered them to God. In that fulfillment is a picture of, and this is very important, both of these things, the, the, the languages and the, and the bread, pictures of Jew and Gentile coming together to create the church, the two loaves. We talked about that last time. This shows how the New Testament fulfills or completes the Old Testament. How In John 10, 16, Jesus said, Other sheep I have besides this flock. That was speaking of the Gentiles. The two loaves of bread that are dedicated at Pentecost have leaven in them. We talked about that last time. As opposed to the unleavened bread of Passover, which represented the sinless life of Christ. The bread now has leaven in it. A picture of sin. Church is made up of sinful people. The church has sin in it. But it's important to note that, that these are both pictures. Today, and, and not just today, but much earlier than today, but the picture later in the, in the, in the gathering of the, as the church came to be birthed, I, I guess I should put it that way, as the church was birthed, these pictures became clear. But on this day, there was no thought of Jew and Gentile. They're all Jews there. On this day, there was no thought of the church is going to be separate from Judaism. None of that took place on this day. That's pictures that was fulfilled that we see later. Just like we put the, the flags on, on the graves, that's a picture that we look back on and see it. But at the very time that something is happening, we don't always see what, it's, what it is. So what's happening on this day? This day. On this day, there's no thought of Jew and Gentile coming together, let alone that of creating the church. On this day... Every person there is a Jew. 
Every person is Jewish. Every person there may recognize God's presence in the wind and the fire. That they recognize. They, they understand that the first Pentecost was the birth of the nation. And this, I believe they're, they're just seeing as the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy that God promised to write the new covenant on their hearts. Jesus said a new covenant I give to you. And I think on this day, they're seeing a fulfillment of that. No picture of the church for them. No picture of Jew and Gentile for them. This is just Jewish people. God is doing what God said He would do. That's what they're excited about. God promised to write the covenant in their hearts. Jesus had just promised them just a few weeks earlier before the crucifixion that He would send another comforter and this day He's doing it. That's what they're recognizing. What they're recognizing is that God is doing what God promised to do. That's why they're so excited. This is the fulfillment. But again, why, why languages? Why did it manifest in languages? And the answer to that is comes in seeing exactly how they were speaking and who was affected by their speaking. So look at verses 5 and 6. And there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout. That's the key there. Devout men from every nation under heaven. That would be every nation where Jewish people had been dispersed to. Every nation under heaven. Verse 6. And when this sound, remember the sound of the wind, not blowing of the wind, but the sound. When this sound occurred, when they started hearing this, this roar of wind, I'm going to go see what that's all about. The multitude, when they heard this sound, the multitude came together and they, my translation says, they were bewildered. The word literally means stirred up. They don't know what's happening because they then begin hearing all these others speaking in a language that they knew from their birth. They were hearing each one speak in his own language and the word language there is the word dialect. They were hearing their own language in these, in these feasts of which the Jews came together. As we, we said before, there were three of them that the Jewish men had to attend. Uh, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Booths. So since Passover and Pentecost were just 50 days apart, many who came for Passover simply stayed rather than go all the way back home and come all the way back again. They simply stayed. And so that says those Jews who were living in, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, but that wasn't their permanent home. They were from these other places, but they had come for this feast. So they, they were there. The Jewish uh, historian Josephus tells us that the population of Jerusalem normally was around 150,000 people, but during this, these feast times would swell to well over a million people coming for these feasts. So, so there are people from everywhere. Verse 5 tells us that they were devout men, as we said, and they would have to be to come and to stay those 50 days every year between those feasts. So... What happened when the sound, when the, when the sound of the mighty rushing wind, but no movement of wind began to move through the city? What happened? They all came to check it out. We, we want to see this thing that's happening. What's causing this loud sound? So they came. The, they were drawn to it to find out what was going on. But as they were drawn to the sound of the wind, as they got closer, then they began hearing the voices of men. They begin hearing them speaking. First they could just hear they, a multitude of voices, a multitude of languages. And as they got closer, each one from a different place began to pick up, that's my language, that's my language, that's my language. And they, they were mesmerized by it. They came together and they began to hear these words said in their own language. As I said, the word language there is the Greek word dialectos, which is just transliterated. It's dialect. I mean, it's like this. Not only were they hearing their own language, they were hearing their own dialect. Not only were they hearing English, they were hearing Southern English. And we all know how different that is. 
the verse 7 says, And they were amazed and marveled. Why? Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? That's, that's like saying, well, ain't nothing but ignorant hillbillies and they're speaking all these languages? How can, how can they possibly know these languages? The Galileans had an entirely different accent. You remember in Matthew 26, uh, verse 73, that Peter came, you know, when Jesus was arrested. And, and someone said to Peter, I know you're from Galilee by the way you talk. Say that again. Say that word again. We don't say that word that way around here. But Peter's language, his dialect, gave him away. The Galileans couldn't pronounce certain words. It's like those of us with, uh, with an Appalachian accent. We're prone to drop the G on the end of our words. We'll say, I'm going to town rather than I'm going to town. We, we, do, we, we do that and we don't even think about it. And there's a long reason behind that having to do with the ancestors that came to this area. But the fact that we do that leads people to think that we're uneducated because of our language, our dialect. It's the same way with the Galileans. How could they possibly know all these languages? In 1 Corinthians 1.27, Paul says that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. Well, verse 8 says... And they, they continued, how, how is it that we hear them in our own dialect to where we were born? These were Jewish men, but they had been born in all these other places. And then Luke describes all the areas they're from. And you should have gotten a little handout this morning of a map to show you where all these different places are and their relationship to Jerusalem. So watch for those as I read this out. All the way from the far reaches of uh, of the, up in the east to Asia Minor to Egypt, Africa, as well as into Rome. So listen to these. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, that's up in the, the northeastern range. That's in the Persia, that's in Iran today. Residents of Mesopotamia, the word Mesopotamia means between, between the two rivers, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Judea, this is not just Judea in and around Jerusalem, but it is all of that to where Jews had, had reached out from Jerusalem. Cappadocia. Straight up from Jerusalem there. Pontius and Asia, that's Asia Minor, over into what is Turkey today. Phrygia and Pamphylia. Then down toward the bottom, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene. Remember Simon of Cyrene who was, was picked to carry the cross of Jesus? And visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, not only those who were born Jews, but those who had been baptized into Judaism and keeping all the rules of Judaism. Verse 11, Cretans, those from the island of Crete, and Arabs, that means those who were from Arabia. And then they say, we each hear them in our own language, our own dialect. But here's something that's really interesting about that. Every one of these dialects, every one of these languages that were spoken that day were Gentile languages. That would have not been lost on these Jewish people. They were used to, when they came to Jerusalem, they were used to hearing Aramaic. They may have heard or known some Hebrew, but Hebrew had mostly been, been taken over by by a form of, of Hebrew that's called Aramaic. They would have all known Aramaic. They would have spoken Aramaic to one another. If, even if you had two, you say you had two men there who was from Cappadocia, they would have not spoken to one another in the Cappadocian language. They would have spoken to one another in, in Aramaic because that's the Jewish language. These were Hebrew, um, excuse me, these were Gentile languages that was being spoken some commentaries disagree or, or argue that there weren't really foreign languages spoken that day because there was no need for it. Because everybody throughout the Roman Empire would have spoken Koine Greek. That was the language of commerce. Well, there may have not been, may have not been necessary, but they did it anyway. 
It wasn't necessary that Pilate put Jesus was king of the Jews in three languages above the cross either, but he did it anyway because there was a reason for it. There was a reason that they spoke in these languages. But now here's the thing. What were these believers saying? Our, our minds automatically think, well, they were saying, you know, they, they were giving the gospel. No, they weren't giving the gospel yet. What were they saying? In verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Well, what were they speaking? Hi, how are you doing? I'm speaking Egyptian. What are you speaking? No, that's not what they were saying. Verse 8. Uh, excuse me, verse 6. The sound occurred. They came together and they heard them speak in their own language. Well, what were they saying? Verse 8. We hear them in our own language. What were they saying? What, what were they saying? What were they actually saying? That's what's important about this day. Look again at verse 11. We hear them speak in our own language. Speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That's what they were saying. That's what they were sharing. This is not the gospel. In, in next week, in our next couple, maybe couple, I don't know if we'll break it up or not, but in Peter's sermon, we will hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ given for the first time. But that's not what they're saying here. They're speaking of the mighty deeds of God. What was the mighty deed that had just happened? They had been given the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it would happen, and God did it. They were praising God. Remember I said at the beginning, they couldn't have kept quiet if they had wanted to. God had done what Jesus said He would do. This infilling of the Holy Spirit so permeated. We said it filled the sound field. Well, this Holy Spirit filled. Remember we said that word meant filled every nook and cranny. It filled every fiber of their being, spiritually, emotionally, physically. They had to proclaim it. Have you, have you ever had something so exciting happen to you or had an answer to prayer that was so amazing or you learned something in Scripture that was so exciting that you just couldn't wait to find somebody to share it with? It was an involuntary reaction. They had to speak of what God had just done. It's like... Uh, if, if you like baseball or you like any kind of sport, if you if we go to the Smokies games, or used to a lot, we sit there, and you may not have any intention of standing up and yelling, but when that bat cracks against that ball, you involuntarily stand up and yell. You, you can't keep from it. it. It just excites you. That's what was happening this day. They were so excited that God had done what Jesus told him he was going to do that they, they couldn't keep quiet. So what was the result? Verses, verses 12 and 13. They, were, they continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they're full of sweet wine. And here we see there are always two responses to every calling, either acceptance or rejection. Sometimes acceptance begins with questions, and there's nothing wrong with questions when they're honest questions. Verse 12 again, they continued in amazement and great perplexity. The, the words amazement or, or perplexity or your translation may say amazed and astonished or amazed and marveled, but those two words are interesting. The word amazed or amazement means to put out of your wits. You and I would say, it blew their minds. Poof. And perplexity or astonished means they wandered in admiration. This, this wasn't a negative reaction. This was admiration. They wanted to know, what does this mean? I, I want to know more about what's happening. But then there's the other response. But others were mocking and saying, oh, they're drunk. They're filled with, with sweet wine or new wine. They've been into the new wine again. But even that couldn't account for the fact that they were speaking in dialectos, in dialects or other languages. The literal translation, well, let me back up, verses 14 and 15, but Peter taking his stand with the, with the eleven raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not, not drunk as you suppose. 
for it is only the third hour of the day. We'll go into that next time. But the literal translation of verse 15 reads, not as you suppose are these men drunk. In other words, oh, they're drunk all right, but not on new wine. Not on what you think it is. It is what Joel prophesied would happen. And I'm excited to share with, share with you what Joel prophesied because I've been studying on that and I learned something just this morning on reading on that that I'm so excited to share. I almost can't keep from it today, but I'm not going to give it away. We'll do that next time. But Peter's sermon will, for the first time, share the very gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with these Jewish men from all over the Roman Empire. But before the gospel can be shared, before, before you can share the gospel with anyone, you have to, the desire to hear the gospel has to be there. You can't just grab somebody by the nape of the neck and start sharing the gospel with them. The desire to hear it has to be there first. The want to has to be sparked. Well, what sparked the want to on this day? It was the sound of the mighty wind with no wind blowing. That drew the multitudes there. Then it was the praises of the people that sparked the desire. What's causing, why are you so excited? The sharing of the mighty works of God created their desire and created the opportunity for Peter then to share the gospel. So what has God done in your life? Has God answered prayer for you? How has He answered prayer? What mighty works can you proclaim to cause someone else to want to know more? That's the key. Something about us has to make others want to know more. Are you excited about what Jesus has done? And is your excitement so contagious that you just can't not praise Him. You can't keep from it. When that happens, others will want to know more. So let's pray. Father, this is such an exciting story. We, 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 we understand.